We have current professors here, and advertising majors, and broadcasters, and filmmakers. How, as people steeped in this environment of communication, or do we create this kind of community and to create this kind of large-scale awareness of our time um, binding biases and our space binding biases, and what kind of balance we should have, and what steps we should take moving forward socially and politically, and things of that nature? Well, that, that's a big question, <laughs> and, and that. that <laughs> That is the trick, and, and you know, one answer is we start by understanding. You know, and that's why we study it is to is to try to understand it. If we can't understand it uh, first, then there's there's nothing we can do that would be effective because we're just sort of flailing about or or making knee jerk reactions either by you know there's the two extremes. There's the uh, um, Technophobia, where where everything is just rejected out of hand, and uh, technophilia, where everything is just we just in love with everything that that comes around. So you have to start thinking about about those um, uh, you know about how to balance all the things that are in our environment and what is the appropriate use, what's not the appropriate use. What are they good for? Um, uh, that was you know Neil Postman had. Um, and it was a very simple thing, but he, you know, he just started to say, um, you know, to what problem is this a solution? And, uh, and, and that were, was a, actually a question that just doesn't get asked a lot. Um, you know, what are we trying to do here? What are we trying to accomplish? Where, where are we going with this? Um, and those, those are the questions we need to ask. And, and one of the things is just not to do things. That's the, and it's, it's so hard because our, we're so geared up to do all that you can. And, and just the decision to say, no, stop, or I'm going to turn off uh, my cell phone for, for some time, you know, even though I'm not in an airplane and I, and, or in class and forced to, you know, but I'm just going to take a break, or I'm not going to get this latest technology. Um, and, and it's tough because on a, on a larger scale, I mean, I can choose not to have a cell phone or not to have a tel television or not to fly in an airplane. I can't choose to live in a society without these things. And that's the really, really difficult um, problem for us is how do we try to um, get our societies to, uh, to, to make a shift? And I'm, I'm not sure I have the answer for that one because you know the problem ultimately is that if if we back off, then some other society is going to push ahead, and and, and so we're, we're constantly driven. Um, I, I, sometimes I think it, it it may only be possible if, if there is some catastrophe that that occurs that forces us in, into that situation. But I think. I shouldn't say everyone, but I think a lot of people understand today that we can't go on. This, this will not continue indefinitely, and, and uh, you know, and, and that, that's really the big question mark is when is the hammer going to fall and when are we going to be forced to, to make that adjustment? And we're seeing some of it today with just, and really it's just an inkling with the financial downturn and, and some of the crazy weather. but. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, that's something we have to think about. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that uh, um, it's important in the educational system to uh, kind of fight against the over-bias of, uh, of the new technologies towards time. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that, um, maybe some specific strategies at, you know, all levels, um, mm -hmm. maybe specifically, like, um, some philosophies about how to present the, the internet as a tool and environment to young people. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, it was a, a balance against the, not against time, but against the, the prevailing uh, tendencies of, of the media. And uh, you know, again, uh, you know, that, that becomes very difficult because so much emphasis is placed on getting computers into the schools, getting the kids access to the computers. Um, I'd say number one is shift, shift in focus. Um, the tech, you know, I, I'm not against the technology in schools per se, um, but number one, teachers. <laughs> right. Education is about relationships between human beings and anyone. You, you, 
if you really want to know, look, what we're, look at what rich people do. Rich people send their kids to private schools where there are very small class sizes. Extremely rich people get a tutor. You know, right? The one-to-one, -one, you know, in terms of educational value, I mean, one-to-one -one is the best. Obviously, there's something to be gained from social interaction, but class size is first and fundamental. It, and, that's, and it's a problem because it's easy to spend money at one moment, buy a bunch of computers, and then you're done with it. It's much harder to hire people and pay a salary continually, whether it's the technicians to maintain the equipment, um, but more importantly is the teacher. So I mean, I think it has to start with, with that, which is the oral and the presence of human beings. And then I, I, we do need to um, put some emphasis on literacy, and when I say literacy, I mean literacy, literacy, uh, because it, it becomes increasingly more difficult. Um, it's simply too many other distractions. Um, and I know that I don't read as much now as I did when I was younger, because there's a lot of good stuff on cable. <laughs> and, and I, I mean, and I do read, you know, a lot of social media and that sort of stuff, but it's, it's not the same as getting, going deeply into a book. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, I think each generation, each step along the way, we're, we're losing that habit more and more. Um, I was just, we just had an event um, at, at my school at Fordham, and uh, Eric McLuhan, the son of Marshall McLuhan, was a keynote speaker at a, a symposium I organized, and he was mentioning how they were cataloging his father's library, which consisted of about 4,000 books. And, uh, you know, I mean, and, and he was someone who read, you know, a book, just a complete book pretty much every day. Um, and, and that's very hard to imagine the, these days. I mean, we just, uh, we just have too many distractions, too many other, other things going on. So we need to try to rebalance that because, because that, that's very important, um, you know, in terms of what it brings to the table cognitively. Um, and, uh, and, and against that, then I think uh, the internet, uh, you know, what's available on there can be, uh, they're very powerful tools. And so, uh, you know, as we use them, we need to, to be very clear, again, on appropriate uses, what's, what's appropriate, what's not, and how to limit it. Um, uh, you know, and one of the problems with electronics, someone can, I, I saw a, a, some study where they, they said the, the dynamics of it are very similar to gambling. You know, in, in, in a sense that it breeds that kind of addictive, compulsive quality. And I, I, I mean, I, I feel it in myself. You know, I get an email and it's like, wow! You know, um, and I know, I mean, it doesn't seem like much to you, but, you know, when you get older, you know. Uh, yeah, but it, it, you just sort of get into this thing of an email, a comment, you know, a, a status update, here's something. Um, it's, this, it's a stimulation. Each bit, each like new thing coming across is like a little stimulus that, you know, kind of excites the pleasure centers in, in some small way, but, um, but you get very, very, it's very easy to become addicted to that. And, and, I, th and I think there, you know, these are things that we need to, to work on. And, and a lot of the antidote is just, again, turn it off and talk to somebody or re read a book, um, but, but not so easy to do today. That's why it, it, it takes work. Um, you, uh, you talked a little bit about religion, like, not a whole lot, um, I was sort of curious, you said it was sort of based on, like, a fixed text, and there's sort of an obsession with that to kind of focus on that and protect it and protect the knowledge, but, uh, toward the end of the speech, you also said we need to balance with, uh, like, science and religion to achieve that homeostasis, mm -hmm. so I was just sort of curious what modern religion would look like or what religion to you should look like in a sort of a stasis environment that you talked about where it's not obsessed with because it I mean it seems to me that without organized tech without a, a text I mean most organized religions are text based so what does that look like I guess? Yeah well when I was talking about the balance I think that 
um, I, I'm not anti-religion, um, and I think that uh, you know, I know there are people who are you know see religion as being completely um, evil or you know completely uh, dysfunctional. But I think that religion ha brings many good things, um, you know, in terms of uh, promoting ethical, moral conduct and and self-control and. Well, um, you know, in the sense of including that idea of the Sabbath, you know, for example, which, um, you know, I mean, that, that's an idea to bring back, I think, in a way. Um, we all could use it, you know. And that really was the idea. You get a day off. Uh, and uh, Tiffany Schlein uh, is talking about, the, talks about this. Uh, she's a filmmaker. She, she was the founder of the Webby Awards. And she and her family now, they um, do... They, they observe Shabbat, you know, the Jewish Sabbath, by, by turning off their computers and, and their TVs and, and just spend time a, a, as, a, as a family. And it's very hard to do. I mean, the, the compulsion to, to check your email, check your status and all that, I mean, it's overwhelming. But, uh, uh, you know, I mean, some, in some ways that, that's a very interesting and I think a you know, very powerful idea. So I, I think it brings a lot to the table. When I mentioned it in terms of education, I think something like comparative religion would, would be a, a very useful subject to be teaching in schools. Uh, you know, and, and, uh, um, but when you ask what does religion look like today, um, I, th I think we can see it, you know, that when, when we move past the type of, well, the text-based era, uh, you know, I think we see it in, in things like New Age spiritualism, um, and, which uh, in some ways goes back to pre-literate or non-literate notions of spirit, spirituality, um, so that there is no longer a fixed text. But we also see it in some approaches to, to religion, where you get people, you know, many people who don't feel like it's either or. It's like you can be a member, you can be a Christian and a Hindu, you can be a Jew and a Buddhist, you can explore different, I, I've been told that the, the Baha'i religion, you can be you know, Baha'i and these other, and another religion, you know, that, that they're not exclusive. Um, so I, I think there are, there are new approaches to religion that are out there, you know, that, but we're not we're, we're not quite recognizing them, but uh, I, I mean the whole idea of New Age spirituality is that there is no one dogma or there's no one, one text, but, but it's whatever, you, you know, people just pick and choose whatever they, they find in, interesting. I'm, so I think that's, that's actually the, the kind of religion that's surfacing out of this new media environment, which you know, what that means for traditional religions is sort of interesting. Um, you know, it's the question of how, as a traditional religion, you know, if, if you're, um, you know, if you're participating or if you're involved in, in, a, in an organized religion, how do you cope with the new electronic environment? Uh, you know, ha has been a matter of co some concern. Uh, I know that um, in, uh, among evangelicals, you know, in particular, there's been a, a lot of concern and interest in the electronic media. But you know, they also ask, what is it doing to, to, to our religion to, be, you know, to, to go on to and, and, and use these kind of media? Um, you know, do we lose a sense of, uh, you know, of God by becoming so... Um, Focused on the human image, uh, you know, of the preacher through the through these media, and uh, so a lot of interesting questions that, that are coming up. But I uh, I think it does signal new media tend to bring in new religions. You know, so with uh, you know that's where you know the the when this not long after the Semitic alphabet appears, um, we get. The Israelites, we get you know Moses and, and Mount Sinai and Ten Commandments, you know, and, and with Judaism. Um, the cri early Christian Church was um, very much um, involved with the parchment codex as a, a new medium, as opposed to papyrus scrolls, um, and uh, and of course the printing press um, gave us the Protestant Reformation. So. What now? Well, you know, I think we're seeing it, but we're, it's, 
nobody, I, we haven't quite put our finger on exactly what it is yet, but um, it, we're definitely seeing a change. Um, well, um, obviously, you know, whenever any of us are seeing on Facebook or YouTube, we're obviously in the back of our minds thinking, oh, I should be going reading a book right now. But what I wanted to ask was a little more personal. Was there any, like, prominent moment or event in your life where you're just sitting on a computer or during your research that opened you up to looking into, like, time and, like, communication media and just the development of it over time and how we just kind of lost the value of it? Hmm. Well, uh, it wouldn't have been when I was sitting at my computer because I, I, I think I would been was interested in these questions before we had personal computers. Um, so uh, uh, I, I can't think of a, of a particular, you know, of a, an extra special moment where I just said, "Wow!" But I think I, 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 I think I've always felt. Um, you know, kind of awareness, or for for a long time, an awareness of the peculiarity of living in time. Um, and I know um, uh, uh, Professor Anton uh, likes to talk about this as well. I mean, Ernest Becker, um, you know, wrote a book called *The Denial of Death*, and and you know, makes the point that human beings are the only form of life aware that, that are aware of our own mortality. And, you know, that messes us up, you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, my God, <laughs> you know, and, you know I, and I can remember that realization, you know, um, I was actually, I was in an elevator, I remember the moment, I was in an elevator, and it just sort of hit me, and I, and, and, and it was just a weird phrase, but I said, um, you know, I'm not an angel. Um, you know, that, that was my, you know, the way I sort of thought about being, you know, mortal and, and, uh, and it scared the shit out of me, I mean, you know, else can I say? Um, and, and we have to find ways to come to terms with that. Um, and, then, and, and Becker says that's what culture does for us. You know, it, it find, gives us a way to live with that knowledge. Uh, and, uh, and you can see so much, and, and certainly, especially in, in religion, there's so much there that is about, that, that literally is deny, the denial of death. Um, you know, it says that death has not really happened um, in order to, you know, to make us feel better. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, that culture gives us a way to live that's heroic. Um, it makes us feel, you know, in some ways like heroes of our own stories so that we, you know, that compensates from, for the you know, complete and utter threat to our self-esteem that, that the knowledge of our own mortality represents. And, uh, and, and actually the idea of heroes was um, something I, the, that was part of my doctoral research. Um, so uh, that... <laughs> Uh, you know, there's an in interconnection there, but uh, I, I think I've, I think time, I mean, you know, I, I guess as a, when you get into scholarship, uh, you know, you, you develop a, start to develop, if you look into the, just the history of everything, you know, just this, this uh, awe at the, the vast history of the world, you know, that goes back, uh, you know, I mean, at least recorded history, you know, for, for millennia. Uh, and uh, it's also sobering to think that it wasn't until the 19th century that people really had a handle on that. You know, and that you go back before that, and, you know, people didn't know their age, they didn't know when they were born, they didn't keep track of these things, you know, they had vague notions, but uh, I had no, I really didn't have the sense of their moment in history, but it's very much for us, you know, we, um, we know exactly where we are in this historical narrative, and, and that's, that's quite extraordinary, I think. Thank you so much for your lecture, and uh, I have one more question. And even in the era of advanced technologies, what do you find uh, the major professional challenges for specialists in communication in a professional setting? Thank you. Well, the challenges for communication specialists are, are just unbelievable, you know, right? I mean, 
Well, I just mentioned history, right? So our colleagues in, um, who study history, you know, I mean, relatively speaking, they got it easy because history hasn't changed. <laughs> and, you know, but for us, it's constantly changing. <laughs> you know, we're just constantly trying to keep up and you can go crazy trying, trying to keep up. So, I mean, I think communication specialists have a very difficult job in, in, in trying to just simply understand the media, uh, media environment because of all the innovation that, that's happening. I, I can't think of a bigger challenge than that. First off, thank you for uh, coming here tonight. It's been a great lecture. Uh, with social media, how do you believe uh, like updates, the documentation of that? Do you think that's light or heavy media? Because I was kind of intrigued by that. Oh, well, I mean, it's certainly light. Um, well, I mean, you know, there's, there's the interesting, it's an interesting question. I mean, we see it uh, perform the function of light media because these are messages that are transmitted. You know, I, I, I go on Twitter, I tweet, and, and it goes out, you know, and, so, and, you know, there are people in all different countries getting it. I mean, you know, that uh, instantaneously. So that's, you know, that's speed of light, light. Uh, but there's a funny kind of added quality to it where with the archiving of, of these messages, and I've come across websites that are not Twitter that were archiving my messages, you know, I mean, not just me, but I mean, I, I don't know if it was everybody, but I mean, you know, I don't know why they, they uh, you know, but there, it just seemed, even the ones I deleted, they still had there, which is, which I'm not too happy about because some of them were mistakes, you know. <laughs> But you know, I and mean, what the hell? Is, what the hell's going on here? Right? I, and, and you know, and that's that that notion of total recall. And, and it's a very strange, it's a very strange kind of environment. And, and and of course, this is the problem for you know the generation growing up with Facebook is that you know, or you know, you in your youth you post a a picture of yourself that uh, you know, upon reflection, you probably shouldn't have put out there. And it's out there, um, and you, and maybe you can delete it, but maybe it's still out there in some versions. Maybe other people downloaded it, and maybe they put it on other websites. Um, you know, people with children are sometimes concerned about this because uh, apparently um, the the people who are do child pornography sometimes take pictures, you know, just ordinary pictures of children, and and use them. Uh, and distribute them. So there, there's, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's just a very strange environment in, in that sense. And yet, on the other part of it, uh, I know that librarians are concerned about digital archives because uh, there is the um, possibility as, as well. For one thing, there's format change. Um, I just, I got, um, I got on my office computer, I got the, a new version of Word. We, got, we, we get new computers every three years, right? Mm -hmm. So it has the latest version of Word for Macintosh. And I suddenly discovered that that version of Word wouldn't open some of my older Word files. I, it just wouldn't open it. Now, I mean, there's a workaround. I've got an older version of Word or on other computers, and you know, I started to make these transfers. Uh, but but these are the kind of concerns, and, and no doubt there are programs out there that could do it. But but these are the kind of concerns that that are voiced that um, that there is there are format changes, there are media changes. Um, anyone play any floppy disks? You know, load any floppy disks lately? Um, I just threw a whole bunch of them out. I was cleaning my office. I don't, I don't even, you know, maybe there was something on one of them that, um, that I don't have anywhere else, but I, I just got to the point where I, you know, I, I can't be bothered anymore. Um, so there is a sense of volatility, and, and then there's that third issue, uh, all, almost like almost Orwellian, almost like 1984, where uh, there, it seems to introduce the possibility of making changes to the historical record that could possibly be untraceable. Um, so it's a different mix of things.
as, the, as all new media present a different mix of things, um, you know, that's what I was saying is that you know, it, seems to be, it seems to be that this, the internet and the web and you know, the whole new media environment is not simply space biased the way we saw radio and television as space biased. It bring, it's bringing back a time bias as well. But in a way that is not, you know, just because you get a balance doesn't mean it's a good balance. And, and that's, that's the question as well, is, you know, it's nice to, it's, it's probably improvement to get a balance, but is this the kind of balance that we want? That's where I'm, I'm not sure, maybe, you know, I, but there still is, you know, the possibility of trying to provide some guidance so that we get the kind of balance that we, we want. Um, and, and then on the other side is that if we go too far in the time bias, I mean, that's where we see, um, and, and I think that that does go along with the rise of fundamentalism and, and some of these other, other kinds of things that, that we see happening. I mean, it's just, it, it fits in with that, so. Um, so there are concerns, yeah. One more, oh, sure, one more, I'm, I'm fine. Make it a good one. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't even know if this is useful to, to even speculate about or anything like that. But, uh, but anyways, uh, would, it, would it be possible to, to unbind? Could we plan some kind of destruction of all recorded history and if it were possible to wipe everyone's, everyone's collective memory? And would it even be possible to wholesale reject symbolic language, although I have a difficult time imagining anything living without language, which I guess is inherently symbolic, but would there be any advantage to us if we were able to do that? Would there be any advantage? <laughs> well, there, those are, no, that's a, it's very, it's a very interesting question, and, uh, and actually a couple of questions there. Um, would there be any advantage? I, I do think that we suffer from history. Uh, you know, I think our in, inability to forget, you know, because that's where you get these long-standing grievances. I, I mean, so, so many of our conflicts today, I mean, you know, these are conflicts that have been perpetuated over centuries, um, you know, and, and that does, that, that is a problem. So, you know, that, that again is why we need that flexibility. I mean, what, what the great thing about oral tradition was the ability to just say this is no longer relevant, you know, not consciously, it just was the part of the process to just slow off, you know, just the stuff we don't need. Uh, and we can't do that anymore. Uh, and, and that has some advantages, you know, to retain things, but it also has its disadvantages. Um, if we wipe the slate clean, I, I think all those science fiction stories in the long, long ago, uh, you know, we'd still start tell, we'd still tell stories and they would turn into myths and we'd probably start the cycle all over again. So, um, I, I think, you know, we need to move forward, not, you know, I don't think we can go backwards and, um, uh, you know, the, I mean, we may have to, I mean, that, that, that may be the case, but I think the ideal is to find a way to move, move forward. Um, the idea of going pa with, without symbolic communication is an interesting one. There was, um, in the early days of virtual reality, some of the virtual reality p pioneers like Jerome Lanier um, talked about sort of post-symbolic communication, right? Because if you can just reproduce the world, you know, through a computer program, then you no longer need symbols in a sense. But what, why do we have symbols? Because they're so incredibly efficient. Uh, you know, that, that's we don't have to experience everything. We can boil it down into a statement or a generalization. Uh, it, it's, um, I think without it, we'd be screwed. I, think, I mean, basically, <laughs> I don't see how, we, how well we'd, we'd survive for very long without, uh, without that capacity. Um, or, or we certainly would return to being a kind of minor species, you know, trying to run some antelope down in the, you know. Uh, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, obviously we evolved out of not having symbolic communication. And, uh, you know, I mean, in, in, you know, in some individuals we do find, uh, 
you know, we find a, a reduced capacity or, or a lack of that. And um, I, I know Corey was reading my the different things I was looking into. I mean, autism is one of them, you know, where um, with uh, individuals with autism, some have no symbolic communication, some have a limited form of that. Um, and uh, they don't, you know, while they, they, they ha can certainly contribute um, to human society, they don't, they don't seem to have the capacity to um, survive on their own. Uh, you know, so it's hard to imagine them, uh, you know, being able to do that in, you know, if we were to go back to kind of hunter-gatherer situation, if you were to have a tribe of, of such individuals. Um, uh, so I, I don't think, I don't think that's going to work, really, <laughs> but uh, I, I wouldn't want it to. I think words, words are great. I like words. Well, on that note, uh, Here are two good words. Thank you. <laughs>